There's no question in your mind, God Almighty. God of mercy. There's no hiding from your face. There's no striving in your God of mercy, God Almighty, let there be light, open the eyes of the blind, purify our hearts in your fire.
Praise the Lord. Why don't you give your neighbor a hug this morning and welcome them to church. Turn around and say hi to somebody that you might not uh, know. We want to say welcome, welcome, welcome this morning to Westside Believers Fellowship. We're so glad that you are all here this morning. Um, this morning I have a couple of uh, awesome things. Um, remember last Sunday I shared a, a scripture that said, um, do not worry basically about what you eat or drink or worry about anything in life. Well, one of the prayer requests that I had last week, if you remember, I said, for these folks, it's difficult. You know, when you don't have a place to lay your head at night, well, guess what? I have a praise report today. It says, last week, me and my family were homeless. This week, we are not. You know, um, <clears throat> man, I was reading this over there and it really um, was touching my heart this morning. Because like I said last week, if one of us is is ailing or has something going on, it affects all of us. And and so we want to, uh, you know, um, there is a time for joy, there's a time for weeping, there's a time for a lot of things in our life, right? But if you're mourning or you're having something going on, we want to mourn with you. When you're joyful, we want to be joyful with you. That's what a family does. Uh, that's what a, a, a body does. So thank you so much for sharing this this morning. It really... Um, it, uh, man, it touched my heart this morning to know that uh, when we join together in prayer, there isn't anything. The Bible says that the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Guess what? We were made righteous through Jesus Christ, so that means me and you. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're holding that little grandbaby and praying for some stomach issues and God shows up on scene. You know, and sometimes it's it's not in our timing. We want something a little bit quicker a lot of times. Um, but let me tell you, a week for that situation, that's awesome. But when God doesn't show up on that exact moment that you want him to, be steadfast. Don't be wavered. Don't be shaken. Don't be, you know, looking at the situation, but rather look to the heavens. Because that's where all good things come from, is from Jesus Christ. Let's sow this morning our tithe and offering. Father, we thank you so much, God, for what you've done this past week, what you're doing today. Father, we are so thankful that you are a God that answers prayers. And Father, we will not be shaken or weary or off put off track by anything or situation in life, God, because we know that we can look to you. And Father, we sow this morning cheerfully and bountifully into the ministry of Jesus Christ, the ministry of grace. Everyone said amen. Men. Well, I want to say some congratulations uh, this morning. The Miglas family has a new member. Uh, Robbie and Ashley got married last week, so congratulations to that. Um, we had some birthdays this last week. Uh, Jim Harmer is 74 years old, uh, so let's give it up for him. Jeannie is um, 27. So uh, happy birthday to all you uh, March babies out there. Um, we're so glad that you were uh, are here with us. Um, on March 23rd at 6 p.m. right here on the uh, at the church, you're invited to a ladies-only night. Um, that's come play Bunko with us. And this one is a Mardi Gras theme. Um, so it's Mardi Gras night. We have masks and beads uh, to give away, but you must keep your... Who made that announcement there? Pastor Regina. I almost got embarrassed right there. <laughs> that doesn't happen very often. Maybe I should pre fruit those before they send them up to me. Why don't you stand this morning and let's continue worshiping. Come on, let's sing it out. If there be
slap your neighbor high five and tell him you're the light of the world. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is so good. Amen. Glad you're here today. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Got a couple of praise reports. Bailey's doing much, much better. Uh, she's got all the tubes out of her, and uh, she's only got one. She's got one tube left, and she, she had four. So they, they're all out, and besides one, and that's really cool. I'm so glad she's really gone through it, guys. And so we need to continually pray for her, all right? Just keep bailing your prayers. Also, um, uh, there are a couple others that need our prayer uh, this, this day. They're, they're pretty sick. And so why don't we just stand to our feet? Keith G., by the way, is doing really good. Sorry, I just told you to sit down, but we do a lot of calisthenics around here. <laughs> it ain't going to hurt you. Hallelujah. How many knows it's going to help you? Praise God. All right, all right. Um, Keith G is doing much better, thank God. And uh, he'll be back here with us in no time. And so uh, we just got some folks. I just got some general general folks. In fact, we're just going to pray for them collectively that, that aren't feeling well, that are sick today. Uh, we need God to uh, go ahead and just heal them up. Amen. And so we're going to believe God for that right now. Father, we just thank you for all those that are in our congregation that aren't feeling well today. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. By the stripes on your back, you paid for every disease. You took it all upon you so that we would not have to bear it. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. We sing your word to heal their flesh. Deliver them from their destruction, Father. I thank you, Father, that they are healed from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Every fiber of their being, Father, I thank you, is receiving strength right now. And Father, I thank you that Jesus Christ paid for it all. We love him so much, and we thank you more than that. He loves us. Thank you for your massive, awesome love for those that we brought before you this morning. Thank you for continuing to bring healing to those that we brought before you, Father. In Jesus' name, and everybody says amen. Amen. Now you can sit down. I promise I won't make you stand up. Well, I was kidding. Stand? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to continue in the series. Uh, this is the last of the, of the series that we're going to um, talk about, Imagine That. And I pray this series has been informative to you. I pray that it's been a blessing to you. I want you to open your ears up real good. Open your, uh, your heart up. Let the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. Let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. Don't let your mind put you on tilt, but just receive with your heart. Amen. Let God do what God wants to do in you today. If you do that, I guarantee you, you will leave here differently than you came. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Why is that? Because God is so in love with you. That's why. I know he cares about everything that you deal with, everything that you go through. I know that he's here right now to minister life and health to you. Amen. And as we preach the word of the living God, the word of God will just wash over our souls. And how many knows God's word brings renewal? Amen. Amen. Father, anoint this teaching today. I thank you that you will anoint me to speak forth your words. Father, I thank you. Without you, we can do nothing. We're just wasting our time. But with you, we can do all things. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name that as I speak today, that the Holy Spirit speaks to the hearts of the people. I pray in Jesus' name that they will see Jesus more clearly. They will see your love in such a greater, huge way. Father, I just thank you so much for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. In this series, we, we've been talking about, um, it's, the series is called Imagine That. And we've been talking about how important it is for us not to be listening to our brain or listening to what our mind is telling us is true. We're not supposed to be uh, following the brain. We're supposed to be telling our brain what is true. Amen. You know, it's as foolish to allow your brain to lead you as it is to allow a computer to define your life. Letting your computer evaluate you and tell you your worth and your value. To tell you what you can do with your life or what people you should befriend or those that you shouldn't. No, that would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Your computer, all it does is it spits back at you what you program into it. Amen. And how many know it's the same with your brain? It is. Your brain is just a biological computer. 
and it churns up all the things that you and I put in it. So as a believer, it's our responsibility to program our brains with the truth. The truth will set us free, amen? That's why you and I have to lead the brain. Say that with me, lead the brain. The Bible says that we must be renewed within the spirit of our mind. The Bible tells us that we ought to be washed with the water of the word to cleanse and renew our thinking and, and, and putting our mind, re, kind of revamping our minds with the reality of our true identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our brains need the right kind of information fed into them for them to work as God intended. Amen. Now, it's interesting that so many people will pay so much attention to what they put in their body. And the reason why they pay so much attention to what they put in their body is they know that their health depends upon it. You know, what you, what you intake, what you ingest through your mouth goes into your body, and it has um, a, a tremendous effect on the overall health of your body. Isn't that true? But when it comes to the brain, it's so interesting that we, pay very, we give very little consideration as to what we put in it. And as a result... We often fill our brains with garbage. Amen? Listen, what you feed the brain is more important than what you will ever fit, uh, fill your body with. And the reason being is, is because as a man thinks, so is he. Say that with me. As a man thinks, so is he. That's why throughout the scripture, the Bible tells us what we ought to be thinking. Right, And we've talked about this, and I'm not going to belabor the point here. But it says here in Philippians 4, it says, Fix your thought on, thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And so listen, what Paul's saying here is that it's our responsibility to meditate on those things that are true and those things that are noble and right and lovely and admirable. Which means when you find stuff in your brain that's not right, that's not pure, that's not noble, that's not lovely, not of a good report, you need to remove those things from your thinking and focus your mind on what is true and honorable and right and lovely and a good report. What is that telling us? It's telling us you need to focus on the gospel because the gospel is the good news. Amen? Amen? And so we need to fill our minds with the good, especially in this, in this world that's so crazy right now, so negative right now, bad things happening everywhere. How many knows you need some good news? Yeah. Amen. So focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to go over to, to Genesis chapter 3. I want to look at Genesis chapter 3. Very important uh, portion of Scripture here. It would take us months. If, if we went line by line through this, it would take us months, maybe a year, to get through this particular chapter. I don't want to, uh, you know, really go in deep in this particular uh, verses that I'm going to look at. But what I want to do is I want to find out where shame first entered the earth. Because today I want to talk to you about shameless. Being shameless. Amen? I want to talk about the devastating effects of shame in people's lives. Look, look at verse 1. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, now this is a serpent talking to a woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Well, of course we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. In other words, don't play around with this thing. If you do, you will die. Now, now um, the tree that the scripture here is referring to is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now think about this. God did not want Adam and Eve, God did not want the human race to know the difference between good and evil. Does that blow your mind? It blows my mind. God did not want us to have the knowledge of good and evil. God didn't want any of us to be able to look at a thing and then evaluate as to whether or not this thing is good or evil by our own estimation. He didn't want man to assess or make judgment about things that he saw or even in his mind. And it blows my mind that this whole thing went down the tubes for mankind when mankind obtained the knowledge of good and evil. What is good and what is evil. Now, please keep in mind, you know, Adam and Eve, they didn't try to assassinate God when they fell. They just simply ate from the tree of the knowledge of good from the knowledge of evil. You see, when they went the self-improvement route, what happened? The entire human race fell. The entire cosmos fell. 
The entire universe fell. Now, some say, you know, their sin was just simply disobeying God. Well, listen, there are plenty of people in the Bible who disobeyed God that didn't bring down the whole human race. You know, there are plenty of people who did, I'm sorry, disobey God, and their disobedience did not bring down the whole human race, right? No, what brought them down was knowing the difference, distinguishing the difference between what is good and what is evil. Man judging within himself what is right and what is wrong. Somebody say, I'm getting this. This act is exactly what separated man from God and it's separating today man from each other. The knowledge of good and evil has always been the great divider. Why? Because in a very large world, the truth actually becomes local. It does. Every judgment about what is right and by what is wrong becomes a product of one's own culture. And actually, it goes smaller than that. It becomes a product of one's own thinking. Now, think of that. So, right and wrong then becomes subjective. You get to choose for yourself, depending maybe on your location or your person. What does this mean? It means that there is no universal truth under that system. When you're evaluating what is right and wrong, there is no universal truth. Right and wrong is just defined by what you think at a given moment in time. Now notice that the tree that we're talking about here was in the midst of the garden, which was in my mind, God's no trespassing sign. God was saying to them, please be like me in my love. Please be like me in my image, but don't try to be like me thinking that you're wise, charting your own path and going out and making your own judgments. Don't reserve that right for yourself to define good or evil or think that you can judge what is good or evil. Leave all of that to me. What are you and I to do? We are just to love. We're to believe in Jesus Christ and we are just to love. Amen? Isn't that the two commands? To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to love others? That's what God tells us to do, right? Now notice the imagery here. God placed this tree in the middle of the garden to show them that everything in life actually revolves around this prohibition. Everything. The only two commands for us is to believe in him and to love. Right? Let's look at verse 4. It says, the serpent said to her, you're not going to die. Remember, she, uh, Eve told the serpent, hey, we touch this, we die. He says, you're not going to die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and that its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. And so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. Folks, this fruit actually, uh, it, it represents a, a belief that they both ingested or they both took on within themselves that they could judge the difference between right and wrong. And as a result of that belief, they were filled with all kinds of judgments, all kinds of judgments. Notice what happened here in verse seven, right? It says, at that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame. The very first thing, the very first thing they felt when they came to the knowledge of good and evil, or when they arrived at knowing the difference between good and evil, they felt shame. They experienced real shame. Isn't that something? They were felt shame at their nakedness, and so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. And so they hid from the Lord among the trees. They were ashamed. So what do you do? When you're ashamed, you hide, right? It says, then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? In other words, you're not in the place that I put you. Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? Now, let me just summarize here for a moment exactly what we just read. The scripture says that Adam and Eve would walk with God every day in the cool of the evening, just at evening, just enjoying one another's company. And before ingesting this wrong belief, their life was just all about loving and walking with God in relationship and God loving and walking with them in relationship. And the truth is that is the exact point 
for us today. This is, nothing has changed. This is what God wants. You and I loving and enjoying God and God enjoying and loving us. But for that to happen, you have to have total trust in the character of God. You have to trust the judgments of God, right? To have a relationship, you have to have trust. You have to believe in one another. And that's why this tree here was planted in the midst of the garden because everything revolves around trusting the character and the nature of God and to be free from judgments on the inside of yourself. That's why the very first thing that Satan goes after here is Eve's picture of God. He suddenly gets Eve to mistrust and he puts all kinds of judgments in her thinking. He tells Eve that God's holding out on her. This is, the, this is what he's planning in her mind. And he's telling her that God is this petty, manipulative deity. And the only reason he doesn't want you to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that he doesn't want you to have what he has. He does not want any competition. Amen? And so Satan says to her, if you trust God, you're going to be missing out. If you just go God's way, you're going to miss out and, and you're not going to become who you're really supposed to be. So Satan suggests to Eve, you can do better. You can do better. Isn't that something? Can you imagine that? You can do better. You need to reach out. You need to go take what's rightfully yours. It's ridiculous. He was actually telling her, you're not okay as you are. You're not okay in the way God created you to be. You've got to do something to to help your image. You've got to do something to help your identity. And so what happened? They bought the lie. Adam and Eve bought the lie. They stopped being a human, a human being and they became a what? A human doing. So in their minds, their worth and value is not no longer or isn't any longer wrapped up in their created identity that they receive from God. It's now wrapped up in what they can do. It's now wrapped up in what they can acquire. And that is the exact state that the world is in today. Amen? Listen, if you don't trust God, who are you going to trust? You're going to trust yourself. If you're not placing your trust in God, you're going to trust yourself, right? And if you don't trust what God says about your worth and your value, you're going to go out into this world and you're going to try to achieve your worth and value and you're going to stop being a human being and become a human doing. Amen? You'll notice as soon as they bought the lie, that poison begins to infect everything in their life. They instantly lost their innocence and they entered into satan's world of judgments they entered into all the performance reviews and the achievement standards and all the comparisons and all the evaluations and they instantly saw themselves as faulty as imperfect actually they saw themselves as defective and this is the world of the knowledge of good and evil folks and so here comes God. He comes to walk with them again in the cool of the evening, in the garden. And where are they at? They're MIA. They're running from God. They're hiding in the bushes behind the trees. And so God cries out to them, Hey, Adam, where are you? And so in Genesis 3, verse 10, again, it says, He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. And I was afraid because I was naked. We've realized that we are defective. We're afraid of this condition we're in. But listen, nothing had changed for them. They were always naked right? Nothing had changed at all, but now they were interpreting their nakedness through a mind filled with judgments. And that's what happens. It changes the, your perspective and everything that you see, believing now that something is wrong with their creative design. And because of that, they hid. Amen? And then God says to them, who told you? that you were naked? Who told you that you weren't okay as you are? Who told you that our relationship wasn't enough? Who told you that you needed to do something to be all that you could be? Who told you that you were defective? Who told you that? Of course, the answer to that question, we all know. Satan did. He planted those thoughts within their thinking and in their mind. And listen, there's a good reason why the Bible calls Satan the accuser, right? He's called the accuser of the brethren. He is the Lord of all judgments. And he'll get in your head. And what he'll do, he'll start accusing you. And you'll start turning around and accusing yourself. And you will start accusing others. Who told you was the question, right? Who told you that you were naked? Well, the man replied in Genesis 3.12, It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit. And I ate it. What does he do? He accuses her. He passes the buck, right? Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? Well, she did the same thing. The serpent deceived me, she replied, and that is why I ate. And so they start accusing one another, and they start passing judgments on others. 
Now, folks, listen, this story isn't about something that happened a long, long time ago, way back there in the Garden of Eden. It is a story of what continues to go wrong in society today. This is a story about us. That's why Paul says so, so important. He says in 1 Corinthians 4 or 5, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. Don't judge anything. Judge nothing. Amen? Listen, when we believe the serpent's lies about us, and how many knows he tries to lie to you constantly? <clears throat> we'll stop trusting in what God says about our worth and our value. We'll go out and try to achieve who we're, tr who we're you know, trying to become. Try to work for it, make ourselves become something, amen? And when we buy this lie, we're going to try to go out and do something to achieve our value. We're going to try to do something to achieve our worth and to form some sort of identity that's going to be acceptable to God. And so our life, it just gets on this, this religious treadmill, right? You just get on this treadmill and you begin to strive to attain what God has already freely given all of us in Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we enter into this world of comp uh, comparisons and performance reviews and achievements and evaluations. When we do that, we eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the result is our lives then become filled with shame. And what do we do? We run from God and the life that he has given us. Amen? And the reason why we experience this shame as a kind of pain is because it's this feeling of lacking worth and needing to try to do something to obtain worth is completely alien to our creative design. We were not made by God to do that. And times, any, any time that you experience something that's unnatural, it always feels like pain, doesn't it? Yeah. Right? It's painful. Listen, we were never, ever, ever in a gazillion years ever meant to feel lack and worth and worthlessness. Never, ever. We were created to have fullness of life. God, we were created, that's why the, the, the Lord tells us we were created in his image and in his likeness. We are to have fullness of worth, enjoying and loving God as God enjoys and loves us. And so when we experience this lack, it feels like pain. It is painful. That's one of the reasons why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the earth is to give us a very clear picture of the relationship that God wants with us. And guess what? He still wants with us. Amen? He wants us to see how he sees he wants us to see like a healthy couple who just has a child looks at their newborn baby. Why don't you put that picture up? Just look how beautiful that looks. Isn't that something? Look at that little guy. Look at mom and daddy just looking at Just keep that picture up for a while, all right? That little baby is just sitting there, lying there. It's being loved. It's not love because of what it can achieve or what it can acquire. It's not love because of anything it can produce. That child isn't going through some sort of performance review by its parents. They're not setting some sort of achievement standard before they love that baby. No, they just love the baby. They love this child. The baby is what it is, right? And they love it just the way it is. The baby's worth is already settled by virtue of the fact that it was born out of the, out of the, out of the love of this loving couple. Amen? And that's how it's supposed to be. That's how our relationship with God is supposed to be. That's how much God loves us. Now, in a few months or so, this baby's going to learn how to love and enjoy its parents just like its parents are loving and enjoying that baby. They're going to reciprocate. Isn't that right? It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be awesome. And for that baby, this is its whole world. And guess what? It's enough. This baby is satisfied. It lives in this blissful world of being cared for by its parents and the parents just loving the baby. And the baby learning to love its parents. That's the kind of relationship that God wants with you and I. And that's the kind of relationship that every heart in this place is yearning for. Amen. We yearn to be loved just like that. And when that happens, guess what? It's enough. Amen. It's perfectly satisfying. It's the fullness of life. It's everything that we've been looking for. Now, sadly, this baby was born into a fallen world, a world that's addicted to eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this baby is born into the world that runs on performance reviews and comparisons and evaluations and judgments and so forth. So it's just a matter of time, isn't it? Just a matter of time before the innocence of just enjoying the loving care of mom and daddy and mom and daddy just loving and enjoying their child. It's just a matter of time before Satan brings the lie and plants that lie into that child's brain that it's not enough to just grow up being a human being, loving others and having others love them. Just a matter of time. 
And so it's not enough to get your value and worth being born out of God's love for you. It's just a matter of time before that baby learns that it's worth is not estimated just by someone's love for you, but it's something that you have to measure up to. And then it'll realize, listen, I don't measure up. It's just a matter of time before that baby embraces this world of performance reviews and achievement standards and evaluations and comparisons. And then it will begin to own them all as it its own. It's just a matter of time before that baby will realize that it's naked and vulnerable, defective, And then it will experience the unnatural pain of shame and want to hide. You see, all these judgments upon us become judgments within us, don't they? All these voices become something within us. And then we tend to believe all these voices that are going on within our heads. And that's what shame does. It freezes you in those shameful judgments. It portrays you as a failure. It portrays you as someone that's no good. It portrays you as incapable, as unwanted, as unworthy, as weak. It tells you in order for you to be loved and accepted, in order for you to be able to fit in, you have to go out and do this or do that. You've got to earn it. All these lies are fed into the brain by the enemy. And what happens? He continues to devalue you. He continues to harass your mind and distort the image that God has created you in. So why? Why would he do that? So that you'll accept this lower form of living, this lower form of life. You'll try to become something by your doing in the eyes of God. And listen, this is the bad part. If you turn to religion to try to help you in this matter, they'll actually put you on a fast track in the process by loading you down with all kinds of rules that you have to follow so you can try to measure up in order to make God happy somehow. Isn't that something? Religion is not what we need. We need relationship with God, loving, believing in loving God and God loving, in, uh, loving us and believing in us. Amen? Listen, the toxicity of shame, the toxicity of the tree of the knowledge of good and, ever, uh, of good and evil will freeze you forever and disable you, and it will put you on the treadmill of religious works day in and day out, trying to make you go out and appease God somehow because you perceive that God is disappointed with you for some reason, that God is angry at you, that God can hardly wait to judge you. Have you ever felt that pain? Have you ever felt you're so far away from God and God's angry and mad at you because of something that you've done? How many knows he says he'll never be angry with you again because of what Jesus Christ has done? Aren't you glad? Man, it's beautiful. But listen, the good news is God will never, ever leave us in some hopeless state. He'll never leave you in a frozen state, right? You need to realize that there's another voice out there that says you never again have to go out and, and, and feel this pain of shame. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will wash them as white as snow. I will never remember your lawless deeds, your sin and your lawless deeds ever again. Amen? The Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world has overcome death, hell, and the grave for my benefit to secure my eternal freedom from all of these things forever. Amen? He's given us life. Now, in Genesis, we looked at where shame came into the world. I want to look at another scripture where shame actually exited the world. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, For the joy set before him, talking about Jesus going to the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning. He actually means disregarding. He disregarded it, right? He condemned it. He judged it, all right? Scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, I find it interesting here that the writer... The writer of Hebrews, he doesn't focus on the crucifixion. He doesn't focus on Christ's impending death here. But what does he focus on? The very first thing that he focuses on is on the shame. You know that? Did you notice that in that verse? He's focusing on the shame. So picture this. The Romans designed crucifixion for the maximum torture and for maximum shame. It was absolutely humiliating. It was. The crucifixion was Rome's way to tell everybody, listen, this is what happens to you if you mess with us, right? And so they made it as painful as possible. They made crucifixion as humiliating as possible. And so they'd take the criminals and they would strip these criminals completely naked in front of everyone and then they would beat them nearly to death and march them through the streets on the way to their crucifixion. 
And as they were walking through the streets, people would begin to mock them and ridicule them and spit upon them and make fun of their genitals and all those sorts of things. It was humiliating. It was so humiliating. It was, it was, it was, it was beyond belief humiliating. It was humiliating as possible. And that's exactly how Rome designed crucifixion to be. This is exactly what happened to Jesus. We know the story about Jesus. He was falsely accused, right? He was arrested. And he was found guilty in a kangaroo court. Then he was sent to Pilate. And Pilate washes his hands. But he has him thrown out there uh, to, to be beaten. And he brings him back before the people. And the people say, hey, crucify him. And he didn't get it. But he said, all right, you know, check it out. You can choose whoever you want. And so they say, we want Barabbas, right? And Jesus standing there, bloody and beaten beyond recognition. You couldn't even hardly tell he was a human being standing there before the people who are yelling, crucify him. And then they take him out, marching through the streets naked, and then they put him upon the cross. And so as the Holy Son of God, he stands there, he's hanging there between heaven and earth. All of his accusers would stand at the feet of the cross. And what would they do? They would spite, be spiteful to him. They would be mocking him. They would be spitting upon him. They'd be laughing at him. They'd be doing all kinds of things. Say, hey, man, bring yourself off the cross. If you're the son of God, do this. If you're the son of God, do that. You know, you could do this here and you could do that there. You could raise people from the dead. You know, bring yourself down. If you're the son of God, do that. But the Bible says, because of the joy that was set before Jesus, Jesus actually disregarded the shame. He considered it as nothing because he saw all the people who was going to be set free by the very thing that he was doing for them. Those people who were mocking him, he was actually freeing them from Satan's clutches. Aren't you glad? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And listen, I don't think it's a coincidence that the shame of nakedness was the very first thing we felt after the fall. And I also don't think it's a coincidence that that's the very thing that Jesus undoes on the cross. The very first thing, the shame of nakedness. He considered it as nothing. The Bible says that he condemned it. You see, the cross, we all know, You've been around here a while, you know, is all about reversing the curse. Jesus reversed the curse of the shame of our nakedness. He was disrobed. Not that we could continually stay naked, but that we could be clothed upon. But we are clothed now with his very righteousness. Aren't you glad? We have his righteousness. And we're never, ever to be naked again. Ever. And through his sacrifice, he removed this deceptive image that, the Satan, <clears throat> that Satan had painted in the minds of people concerning God, that God was manipulative, that God was petty, that God was angry, that God is unloving, that God is lying, that God is a deceptive God. God just wants to judge you. He hates you, right? That's a lie that the enemy puts in our thinking, a God that can't be trusted and a God that can never be pleased. That's the lie of the enemy. No, Jesus revealed on the cross that actually God's just the exact opposite of that. The exact opposite. Jesus revealed a God who thought each of us was worth dying for. Amen. The cross reveals the unconditional love of God and that we have tremendous worth and value despite what we do or we don't do, despite what we achieve or don't achieve, despite any of the things about us. God says, I love you. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to save you myself. I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to fix you. I'm going to make you holy. I'm going to make you blameless. I'm going to take care of everything. Just believe in me. And when you believe in me, let that love that I have for you go out for others. That's what I want. Believe in love. Believe in love. Just like the parents of that newborn baby. How they're looking at their child. The cross revealed a God who does and has done everything possible to restore our relationship with him and prove to us that we never had any reason to ever run from him in the first place. We have this fullness of life just by loving and enjoying him and him loving and enjoying us. And folks, if you believe this, it completely exposes the lie of shame, it exposes the lie that Satan has told us about worth and identity, that it's something for us to go out and achieve and something that we have to go out and try to attain, that it's somehow associated with our performance reviews and our evaluations and our comparisons, you know, and our faithfulness and all these things that religion stacks up and says you must ascend to in order to ascend to God. 
That's all crap. Just so you know. It's just religious garbage. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only son why? because we couldn't save ourselves no matter what we do. You understand? We have to receive his salvation, his life. The cross blows all of those lies to pieces. It destroys them all. Your worth, your worth and your value was fully seen by God on Calvary. Peter says he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, talking about Jesus, but was manifest in these last times for you. He was revealed for you, right? Who through him, believe in God, through him, through Jesus, believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. Why? So that your faith and your hope are in God. God says, I, through Jesus, I'm restoring faith and hope in me. I'm restoring all these lies that the enemy has told you. I'm restoring you back to me that you can believe in me. Those lies are gone forever. Look to my son. Jesus condemned shame and he considered it nothing. And the scripture says this. I love this. I'm done right here pretty quick. You know, I get three closings. This is number two. Hebrews 12, 2 says he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. God put him in the highest place of honor. Now you think that's great. Isn't it beautiful? That's great. Jesus sitting up there right at the right hand of God in place of honor. Isn't that just beautiful? Hallelujah. Good for Jesus. Now there's more to the story, isn't there? Because see where he sits, you sit too. <laughs> Ephesians 2 says God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he's raised us up with him. And he's seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? Why? So that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. God wants you to see his kindness. He wants you to see how important and valuable you are to him. So the question is, will you believe it? See, we got to believe, right? Believe in love. Believe in love. Will you walk free of shame by faith because of what Jesus has done for you on the cross? Will you again put faith in your creator who tells you that you are seated now at the highest place of honor in Jesus Christ far above all things? because of the sacrifice of Christ? Or are you going to believe all those voices in your head that are telling you you're naked and unworthy and worthless and defective and unfaithful and uncaring and blah, 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 blah. Is that what you're going to believe? Whose report are you going to believe? The choice is up to you. Take responsibility for your mind and renew it with the truth. Do not follow the mind. Lead the brain. Fill it full of the right information. Think on these things. Come to faith in Christ and let his love for you pull you out of sin and transform your life forever. The truth will set you free. Free. Y'all want freedom? The truth will set you free. What's the truth? Jesus Christ came into the wor world to save sinners. Paul says he was the chief, but I don't know. I think I got him beat. He was a chief sinner, right? Jesus could save Paul. Jesus can save any of us. And you not only can he, but he has. You just need to wake up to the fact that he's already done everything he's going to do for you. It's done. So what do you do? You just accept the gift. That's why it's called the gift of righteousness. You receive the gift. And you do that by placing your faith in him and being free from shame forever. Getting off the treadmill forever. Off of it. You're done. You're done with the treadmill. It's over. No, nothing to send your way up to heaven. Nothing you got to do to make yourself better with God. Christ did it all. Do you think for me, you know you you know you. Do you think for a minute that you can fix yourself enough for God to accept you? To be in the presence of God, you have to be as holy as God. Who can do that? 
Of course, it would be just, it's just stupid, it's ludicrous for us to think for a moment that we can be so good through our works and our efforts and our deeds and our faithfulness and all that stuff for God to accept us. It's stupid. The only one that can fix you is God. And He made you holy. He made you blameless. He made you righteous. You see, Jesus as our representative fulfilled everything. It's done. It's finished. It's over. Huh? Satan's out. <laughs> Been watching too much baseball lately. <clears throat> it's gone, man. Your shame's over. No more shame. No more. Well, I fail. Well, welcome planet Earth. We all fail. And anybody that tells you they don't fail, they're liars. They failed. Right? So we're all in this thing together, and God says, listen, I'm saving the whole boat. I'm reconciling the entire world to myself, and this is the only difference, those that are awake to it and those that aren't, those that are blind to it and those that can see. Right? That's the difference in the world right now. God reconciled the entire world to himself, right? Not imputing their trespasses to them. But God said, come on, come on board. Everybody's good to go. I've removed all your sins as far as the east is from the west. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll wash them as white as snow, right? It's all done. It's finished. Now, will you wake up to it? Will you open your heart up and say, you know what? There's no reason for me to ever run from God ever again. There's no reason for me to have this shame and feel unworthy and feel all, this, all these feelings of this religious uh, standards and all this stuff just going on in my brain telling me I don't measure up. Listen, you didn't measure up. That's why Jesus measured up for you. He was your representative. Now you're free. So enjoy your freedom. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. Let's enjoy it. Let's enjoy this freedom in Jesus. And let this truth free your mind so that you'll fill your mind with thoughts that you should be meditating on. Bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Everything Christ paid for, take that thought to it and say, if it didn't measure up with what Jesus gave me, then guess what? Boot it, baby. Amen? Amen. Stand with me. I'm done. I can go on forever. But folks, we got to imagine this. This has got to be in our thinking all the time. Because if you think for a moment that Satan's just going to say, okay, well, now they know all this stuff. I'm not going to harass them anymore. <laughs> I'll never, ever tell them another lie now. I'll never tell them they're unworthy or they're just a piece of junk. I'll never, ever do that again because now they know. No, before you get out of this building, he's going to tell you that. I'm telling you. He'll harass you continuously. Now, you've got to make up your mind. What are you going to feed your brain with? Are you going to think of the lovely and good report? The gospel, right? We talked about that a couple weeks ago, right? Are you, going to, are you going to take the gospel, the good news, meditate on the good news? Are you going to let him fill your mind with lies and devalue you in the eyes of your creator and cause you to hide and run from God when there's no reason at all when God's saying, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? No, no, no. He's not saying that no more because you were lost. He found you. The only, the only problem is your brain thinks you're still lost. See, we don't recognize because of Satan's lies all these subtle barriers, these walls that Satan puts up in our thinking to bring separation between us and God. Tony, right now, tear those strongholds down in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's be free. Let's be free. You're good to go. You're good to God because of Jesus. Amen. And He loves you, and He'll never, ever, ever betray you. He's a friend that sticks closer than any brother. It's over. Man. I can walk with God in a loving relationship with God and God will love me. I can enjoy his love and bask in his love and I can love him and there's no problem with me understanding the character of God. He loves me. Just like those parents love that baby. He loves me. Why don't we just reach our hands to heaven right now? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that set us free. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. That's ministering to hearts right now. Satan has got some folks in here just so bound up, so on their own case. They're so imprisoned with all these thoughts in their mind of being less than, 
unworthy and just so feeling so much shame in their life. Father, I thank you the gospel has set them free. The truth about your love for them and about what Jesus has done for us. They'll walk out of here 10 feet tall, being so free, just unloading all those burdens. Why don't you right now, folks, why don't you just cast your care upon the Lord? This this very moment, just cast all of that at his feet right now. Father, we put this at your feet. We put this at the feet of Jesus, who bore our load so that our burden would be light. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that as we stand here before you, we stand before you cleansed and purified because of our faith alone in Jesus Christ. And I thank you, righteousness, this wonderful gift you have given us is not something that comes and goes, but stays with us for all eternity. I thank you, Father, that we are yours and you will never leave us or forsake us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you don't know Jesus today, man, you are in good a place to be right now. Because right now I just gave you the gospel and told you how much God loves you and there's no reason for you to run. Just open your heart up and say, I believe in Jesus. I believe that he died, rose again. That's it. He's the Messiah, the Son of God. And he is our king. It's coming back someday very soon. Just pray with me. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. And I believe that you died for me washing away all my sins. I trust in you to save me right now. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your love and all you've given to me in Christ. And today, I am born again, a brand new creation. Today, my life changes. Thank you, Father for loving me in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, I just feel God's love, don't you? Don't you just feel the sweet spirit of the living God just just massaging your spirit and your mind? Listen, don't ever forget. Don't ever forget what God has done for you through Jesus Christ. You were His. And you know, when the enemy tells you otherwise, guess what? Kick him to the curb. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big clap offering. Let's just love on him. Amen. Now, we're having a a seminar right after service, and it's for living trusts and wills, helping you to know um, how to arrange everything when you check out and go see Jesus. You need to be able to fix everything beforehand. Amen. And so, Brother Dan's here with us, and he's going to be meeting. We're going to meet right out in the foyer. And so uh, if, if um, you want to be a part of this, we know we had over 45 people or 40 people sign up. So um, uh, if you want to join us, you didn't have to sign up. That's just hopefully we'll have enough food. But please stay and, and uh, learn about living trusts and wills. All right. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. We'll see you Wednesday night, 630 right here. All right. God bless. Bye bye. See you, Ralph.